Good morning. Good morning to you all. We appreciate the time uh, you taking the time to join us today for a presentation from the Mayo Clinic P30 team. I'm a musculoskeletal epidemiologist and I lead the methodology core of the center grant at Mayo Clinic. And our P30 center is exclusively focused on orthopedics and total joint arthroplasty research. The initiation of our relatively new center was about three years ago and coincided with the growth of the AI methods in orthopedics. And today we have two speakers and they lead many of the development and application of AI projects in orthopedics, primarily using clinical and radiographic data that are obtained as part of routine clinical care of arthroplasty patients. The first speaker is Dr. Cody Vilas. He's an orthopedic surgeon and assistant professor of orthopedics and uh, clinical anatomy at Mayo. And he recently joined uh, the consulting staff at Mayo in the adult hip and knee reconstruction division. He's the director of the orthopedic surgery AI lab here at Mayo, which we call it OSAIL. And Dr. Puria Rothschild is a medically trained data scientist and has been integral part of our orthopedic research team over the last two years. And his interests are in the area of computer vision applications in radiology. The two present Stations today are broadly focused on potential clinical applications, as well as how we go about creating the data infrastructure for our projects. Uh, Cody, whenever you are ready to begin, please go ahead. All right. Thank you all for that kind introduction and Kate for uh, organizing this and uh, getting this all together. We're very excited to participate. Um, as Dr. Kremers mentioned, uh, my name is Cody Wiles. I'm a hip and knee orthoplasty surgeon here at the Mayo Clinic. Um, and one of our main interests from a research and clinical care improvement perspective is on leveraging technologies within artificial intelligence. And so the title of this talk is Artificial Intelligence in Orthopedic Surgery, The Future is Now. Uh, by way of a little bit of background, um, I'll be giving a little bit more uh, high level flavor uh, to begin some of the more clinically relevant implementations of what we've been doing within OSAIL. And then Dr. Ruzrook will follow me and go into more detail on some of the key studies that I'll be first introducing, giving you a deeper methodologic perspective and how one might follow a roadmap to implement uh, similar infrastructure efforts at their own institution. So I'd like to begin by recognizing all of our colleagues in the Mayo Clinic Orthopedic Surgery Artificial Intelligence Laboratory. This is a truly interdisciplinary group made up of orthopedic surgeons, radiologists, data scientists, epidemiologists, and biostatisticians. And our focus is on leveraging AI to maximize insights that we can gain from radiographic data and multimodal data sets. So what is artificial intelligence? Well, it is a type of complex math to identify patterns in data at its most sort of fundamental. Machine learning is a subset of this that aims at developing predictions from data, and deep learning is a further subset still that relies on neural networks for analyses. So why study artificial intelligence? Well, the answer to this question is going to be different for every person, but for me, it comes down to one uh, quote someone said directly to me a couple of years ago, unfortunately, and they said, Cody, since you don't have any real intelligence, maybe you'll have better luck with artificial intelligence. And that quote was from my wife, so that stings a little bit, but uh, I've had a great time doing this and learned a lot from great colleagues like Dr. Ruzrook along the way. So in a way of framing this, there are some tasks that are better suited than others for artificial intelligence. It doesn't work for everything. So I'd like you to keep these three categories in mind as we go through the talks today to frame what we think are the best implementations. So the first is in the area of automation or improving our speed and efficiency at accomplishing a given task. The second is with augmentation, improving acuity or accuracy for task specific functions. And the final is in aggregation, using multimodal data sets and next generation analytics to solve problems. So as an outline for the type of studies I'll be talking about this morning, the first is in our efforts with radiographic annotation. Then we'll move on to risk prediction modeling. 
followed by synthetic image generation, and then a quick word at the end on some of our efforts here in OSAIL towards education. So beginning with radiographic annotation. Radiographs really are the cornerstone of orthopedic evaluation, especially for us as orthopedic surgeons. These radiographs underlie the full spectrum of care for our patients from diagnosis and prognosis all the way up through treatment and longitudinal surveillance. But linking clinical and imaging data has historically been very challenging. At Mayo Clinic, we're fortunate to be home to ultra-rich data sets, including our total joint registry that was initiated in 1969 by Dr. Mark Coventry. But until now, this data has not been fully integrated with our radiographic data, which we consider a missed opportunity. So this has been a key infrastructure effort we've focused on in OSAIL, but it's worth pointing out that establishing medical imaging registries is very challenging. That's why others haven't done it and we have not done it previously. Techniques such as manual cleaning and labeling are very tedious and relying on DICOM metadata can be an error prone practice. So we saw a solution in developing a deep learning pipeline to curate a radiography registry in a more automated, streamlined fashion. Now, this is a study that Dr. Ruzrock is going to go in a lot of detail on, so I'm going to just give the very high-level overview, but there's nothing wrong with repetition when it comes to something like this. So to develop this radiography registry, we looked at roughly 20,000 patients from our TJR over a 20-year period and identified roughly 850,000 hip and pelvis DICOM files for those patients. So our goal is to create a deep learning pipeline to classify these DICOMs based on their salient features, things like what is the radiographic view? What's the laterality that we're interested in? Is it a native joint or is there the presence of an implant? And again, Dr. Ruzrock will go into this in more detail, but the quick take home is that once fine tuned, these algorithms had extremely high performance, near 100% on all the metrics we tend to care about. But most importantly is the next data point. This was able to annotate and curate this registry in roughly eight hours, which would have taken a small group of people several months, if not a full year to do with maximum effort. So a massive improvement in efficiency for sure. So why are radiography registries important? Well, they help us link clinical and radiographic data sets, and this enables more robust multimodal studies, which I'll be showing you some examples of this shortly. So in OCL, we started with the hip and pelvis, but we're now expanding in a stepwise fashion to look at the spine, shoulder, knee, and elbow, and we'll keep expanding from there. Once we had a radiography registry, the next step was to develop a way to annotate these radiographs in an automated fashion. So we've recently completed a single composite algorithm that can identify 22 discrete structures on an AP pelvis X-ray that we tend to care about in orthopedic surgery, and it can do this in preoperative and postoperative x-rays. So as an example of the type of future work this will potentiate, we'll be able to apply this to a preoperative and postoperative x-ray and understand changes in leg length and offset, which are two very important parameters that a hip surgeon pays attention to after a replacement. We're doing similar work in the shoulder on annotations, as well as the spine, as I alluded to. And once fine-tuned, these will allow them to solve some next-generation questions within those specific anatomic domains. But one thing that this really boils down to and sort of our clinical end implementation focus that we're thinking about is automating the basics in x-ray reports. A lot of the fundamental information that we care about as surgeons is not included in x-ray reports. So here are three x-rays from a patient that I recently saw in consultation, and there's many things that I would uh, love to comment on here and have documented, but a typical report that we get associated with these type of x-rays is as follows. It will say, there's a left total hip arthroplasty, there's no evidence of loosening, and there's some degenerative arthritis of the right hip. All of those things are true and objective, but it's a real missed opportunity to document a lot more of the information that we think is important. And that's where I think we can use AI to build this in, in an automated fashion to complement what our radiologists are doing every day. So along those lines, one of the things we've developed is an acetabular angle calculator based on the fundamental question of whether we can measure static implant position. In this case, the acetabular inclination and version. We put this AI to the test against our surgeons and the mean difference between the AI and the surgeon measurements was just one degree. It's able to annotate these in less than seven seconds per image. And we recently leveraged that speed to annotate more than 10,000 x-rays overnight to define a new acetabular safe zone. 
So here's a graphical user interface to show you an example of how this works. You'll see us pulling up an AP pelvis x-ray of a patient with bilateral hips and bilaterals were chosen for this example to show you it's capable of doing both at the same time. The algorithm will then generate a predicted mask and then finally measure those angles for the left and right hip respectively. We've also developed an angle calculator that measures joint alignment, in this case, the hip, knee, ankle, angle. So it can do this on preoperative and postoperative x-rays, which is important because it gives us our pre to postoperative changes. And when we put this algorithm to the test against our surgeons, once again, it was quite precise, rough difference of uh, mean difference, excuse me, of roughly half a degree for both the preoperative and postoperative x-rays and can annotate this in less than six seconds per image. We've now moved on to a more challenging question in developing a subsidence calculator. And this is the fundamental question of whether we can measure change in implant position. So I just showed you we could measure, measure static implant angles, but measuring differences between x-rays is more challenging. And in this case, what we looked at is femoral component subsidence between two x-rays spaced out in time. When we put this to the test against our surgeons and the mean difference between the AI and those surgeon gold standard measurements was just 0.3 millimeters. The algorithm was able to quantify subsidence as small as 0.1 millimeters and able to perform this annotation in less than eight seconds. So here I'm showing another graphical user interface where you'll see me pull up an AP hip x-ray of a patient taken three months after their surgery and then an x-ray of that same patient taken roughly two years after their surgery. And on quick visual inspection, it doesn't look like there's a whole lot of change happening here, but the AI has correctly identified that this patient has subsided or changed the position of their stem just over three millimeters, which for most uh, stem types would definitely be getting my attention. For this particular stem type, it is known to do this, but again, the fact that we can measure that gives us a clue of how we can identify those implants of concern. And that dovetails to the next slide on how should we use such an algorithm? And it really is about identifying implants of concern. This is in no way meant to supplant expert review by radiologists and orthopedic surgeons, but rather to serve as a canary in the coal mine to identify those implants of concern that should undergo further scrutiny and greater review. So some of the take home points from this part of the talk are the AI assisted post-operative x-ray annotation tools are already viable in the clinic here and now. They help us with alignment measurements, implant angle measurements, changes in implant position, and we can also identify implants based on make and model. Data not shown here for the sake of time, but that's something we're able to do as well. So I hope this gives you a sense that we have a series of powerful augmenting tools as radiology reports often lack some of the information that we care about of greatest orthopedic concern. So now moving on to risk prediction modeling. By way of background, dislocation and periprosthetic fracture are some of the most common reasons for revision after total hip arthroplasty. They routinely show up as two of the top three reasons for that in most registries. So with that, we set out to develop a series of multimodal risk calculators to determine risk for dislocation and periprosthetic fracture. Firstly, by determining patient specific risk. And secondly, and I would argue more importantly, determine the degree of risk modification that can be achieved with surgical decisions. So to create these calculators, we evaluated 30,000 patients operated on over a 20 year period at the Mayo Clinic and characterized them based on their non-modifiable risk factors, things like demographics and comorbidities, as well as modifiable risk factors, things like implant choices and surgical technique. And some of the lessons we've learned are that dislocation and periprosthetic fractures are extremely wide ranging. This can be anywhere from 1% up to 20%, just at the one-year time point based on a patient's comorbid profile. However, we also identified that surgeons have immense power to modify risk, as operative decisions were shown to be the most influential factor in our final models. <clears throat> Excuse me. However, version one of these calculators was developed with traditional statistical methods, so we asked ourselves if we could perhaps perform even better with artificial intelligence methods. Firstly, by incorporating deep learning evaluation of the preoperative x-ray, and secondly, by incorporating machine learning survivorship modeling. To that question of deep learning image analysis, we developed an image classifier that was based on a single preoperative AP x-ray and only told that algorithm whether 
the, or excuse me, only told uh, the, the model whether the patient sustained a post-operative dislocation or a fracture. And with that information only, it was able to achieve an area under the curve of 0.77, which is pretty remarkable. Again, when considering this is based only on a single preoperative AP X-ray. So the question of survival model performance, our Cox regression model with the traditional statistical methods achieved a C index of 64%, which is quite respectable, but the multimodal AI model outperformed this with a C index of 74%, albeit it had the benefit of that imaging data. Nevertheless, those imaging features were more predictive than any clinical variable that we tend to think about as the most deterministic in a patient's risk. So to give you a further sense of that, this is what's known as a SHAP plot in AI. And um, as a little bit of a heuristic or shortcut, this is essentially a variable importance plot ranked from one to the end. So to the right here, I've zoomed in on the 13 highest predictors within this model. And 10 of those were features that the AI picked up from analysis of the preoperative image. Only three clinical variables cracked the top 13 and these are the parameters, once again, that we talk about ad nauseum in textbooks, lectures from the podium as being the things that determine risk. And maybe that's not the whole story. So to give you a patient example here, this is an 80-year-old female with a BMI of 30, undergoing a primary total hip arthroplasty for osteoarthritis. She has a history of osteoporosis and mild cognitive impairment. She also has a degenerative spine, but no prior spine surgery. So here's another graphical user interface where you'll see me put in those relevant parameters for demographics and past medical history. I'll then pull up a single preoperative AP X-ray of this patient, and you'll soon see a risk matrix for this individual with 18 different possibilities showing their risk of dislocation. So you can see in the upper right-hand corner in red that this patient potentially has a risk as high as 9% for dislocation, which is quite high risk. However, based on some decisions within my control in the operating room, I could potentially get that risk to less than 3%, so quite a difference. Now, here's the corresponding risk matrix for that patient for periprosthetic fracture. And once again, she's at extremely high risk, near 10% for a fracture, based on certain decisions within my control. But once again, I could potentially modify that to a high degree, getting that down to near 1% with certain decisions. So some of the take home points from this work are that deep learning image analysis and machine learning survivorship modeling are powerful tools for patient specific risk prediction. And further, deep learning image analysis may provide us some new insights into pathophysiology of our major complications beyond some of the traditional risk factors that we talk about. So I hope this gives you a sense that these AI enabled calculators can help us as surgeons and other clinicians as well risk stratify and individualize patient management. So now moving on to uh, what I think is some of the most exciting work we're doing in OCL, and this is in the realm of synthetic image generation. So synthetic imaging is really a multifaceted problem solver. You see this graph on the right, and this shows the percentage of AI models today currently trained on real versus synthetic data, and real data is currently king. But by 2030, the script will absolutely be flipped, and synthetic data will be driving the vast majority of models. So what can we do with this in the realm of healthcare? Well, the first is creating massive data sets from scratch. The caveat being that the data and those models are trained on high quality real data, like we're fortunate to have here at Mayo Clinic. Secondly, we can eliminate patient privacy concerns with fully synthetic images. And lastly, this enables us to perform some quite novel image transformation techniques that I'll be sharing with you here briefly. So there are two main techniques to know about in the realm of synthetic image generation. The first is the generative adversarial network that through two competing algorithms develops increasingly realistic images by training on looking at real images from what you see on the far left as a gray uh, soupy blob all the way up to a very realistic image after roughly three quarters of a million training sets. So this video is 100% synthetic x-rays all morphing and interpolating into one another just to show you the broad spectrum of anatomy and pathology that we can generate on demand. But these algorithms are extremely powerful. They pick up on very subtle details from these x-rays. So as this video comes to a conclusion, please draw your attention to the bottom right-hand x-ray and look at the top left-hand corner of that x-ray. And what you see is something that looks like a patient identification marker. 
Now, this is all synthetic. That's not a real identification marker, but this model has learned that oftentimes patient ID numbers tend to fall in the corners of x-rays, and they tend to be about seven to nine digits, as is the case here. The next type of model to know about is the, the denoising diffusion probabilistic model. That's a mouthful, so we'll call these DDPMs. And these have gained a lot of attention recently. You might have read about the DALI-2 model that creates art from text using natural language processing and DDPMs. More recently, people have uh, seen a lot of attention from chat GTP. And, but what you can see on the DALI-2 website, as an example, is ask it through text prompt to generate a picture of an astronaut riding a horse in the style of Andy Warhol, which is a pretty esoteric request. But within a matter of seconds, it will be able to generate this type of image on demand, which is pretty amazing. So how does this work for x-rays? It begins with what's known as a forward diffusion process where we create a noisy image. So we're taking this x-ray and deconstructing it down to isotropic random noise. Looks like salt and pepper. And from that isotropic random noise, it will then undergo the reverse diffusion process or what's known as incremental denoising of the image. And sort of like a phoenix rising from the ashes from that salt and pepper, it will reconstruct a fully synthetic, and I would submit to you a quite realistic uh, pelvis x-ray. So the big question, however, is how high fidelity are these synthetic x-rays? So here I've given you on the top row five real examples, and on the bottom row, five synthetic examples. On quick visual inspection, they look pretty similar, but we have put this formally to the test asking our musculoskeletal radiologists and orthopedic surgeons to evaluate these side by side in a blinded fashion. And in doing so, they are exactly 50% accurate or a flip of a coin. In an assessment based on computer fidelity, it's achieved an excellent rating. And we've taken these synthetic x-rays and fed them back to some of the prior algorithms I discussed earlier in the talk, and they've achieved 98% precision. So all that to say that the take home here is that these are really nearly indistinguishable from real x-rays. What are some of the applications of synthetic images? Well, the first is in the area of customizability. We want to be able to generate patient-specific outputs. For example, show me a 76-year-old woman with a BMI of 34 and severe arthritis. So here's a graphical user interface to show you how this works. Here, we'll be asking the algorithm to generate an AP left hip x-ray of a patient without a hip prosthesis. And in a matter of seconds, it will do that. And we can iterate this as many times as you would like. But one of the things we've been very impressed with these algorithms is their ability not just to pick up on bony anatomy, but soft tissue shadows as well. So here, you'll see me pulling up an example of a patient with a very low BMI, a very skinny patient, BMI less than 18. And that certainly is the case on that x-ray. And now we'll show a corresponding example of a patient with a BMI over 40, which is a very different soft tissue picture, and the x-ray does a very accurate job of doing that. Another application for these synthetic images is in performance prediction. So we're very excited now about the ability to generate post-operative outputs from simple preoperative inputs. So we developed this algorithm, and we call it THANet for short, and this has a few implications. The first is enabling next-generation templating for our cases. It can also help potentiate some other complementary technologies like augmented reality and robotics, and perhaps even help us design new implants. So here's an example of how this works. This is a real preoperative x-ray from a real patient. It then gets fed to the algorithm and it will generate some of that isotropic random noise over the hip of interest, and then generate a predicted post-operative x-ray complete with the type of implants and the positioning and all the rest. For comparison, here's that patient's real post-operative x-ray. And I would argue that the computer's version of this actually looks a little bit better. So here's some more detail on this. We actually have a couple of different versions of TA chain. The first is where we quote, let the surgeon decide. So I, as the surgeon, can pre-specify the type of implants that I want the algorithm to incorporate. Let's say I want a specific acetabular component and femoral component. It can do that. So here we've asked it in eight different iterations to generate a post-operative x-ray for this patient based on eight different stem types that are very common in the Mayo Clinic registry. And you see eight different examples there. And here's that patient's real post-operative x-ray where one of those eight was actually chosen. <clears throat> 
there is yet another version where we let the model decide, so to speak. So we call this more of an agnostic approach. We let the algorithm not only determine what the x-ray should look like, but what implants should be used to match this patient's anatomy. So here we've asked it eight different times to iterate and it's chosen the same implant eight different times. So the model's showing a degree of confidence in that selection. And that's reassuring because in this case, that is also what the surgeon chose. So we've once again put this to the test. We've put a real post-operative x-ray and a synthetic post-operative x-ray side by side. And in a blinded rating by our orthopedic surgeons, they are exactly 50% accurate once again on deciding which is real, which is fake. But the more important data point that I'd like you to pay attention to is bullet point number two. So we also asked these orthopedic surgeons in a blinded fashion to rate what we called the surgical execution of the x-ray. Basically, how good does that x-ray look on a scale of zero to 10? And to our surprise, the synthetic x-ray is actually outperformed with a mean score of 9.0 for the compared to the real x-rays with a mean score of 7.9. We've also taken these real and synthetic x-rays and fed them to our acetabular angle calculator that I discussed earlier in the talk and assessed what percentage of the acetabular components fell in the quote safe zone. And once again, the synthetic x-rays outperformed here achieving this 97% of the time compared to 87% of the time for the real x-rays. So at least on one very objective metric, I can tell you something that the algorithm seems to have picked up on as important for post-operative performance for these patients and these implants. Yet another area still is in the area of bias detection and reduction. We're working on algorithms to identify imaging biomarkers for race and sex. And the really important potential implication here is being able to balance data sets by race and sex. In the Mayo Clinic Total Joint Registry, we have a predominantly Caucasian population that may not represent other parts of the country. And so through synthetic x-rays that can take these factors into account, we could potentially make more balanced data sets that are representative of broader populations. So here's another example from our graphical user interface where you'll see me pre-specify race as a variable. And these algorithms have been learning on thousands and thousands of x-rays. And while it will not point out the specific features that it incorporated, it has incorporated those subtle different features. And again, we hope to use this to mitigate bias and to create uh, balanced data sets, as I discussed. A quick word on future frontiers with synthetics. Some of the other things we're working on are in the areas of manipulation. So automatically adjusting parameters such as tilt and rotation on an X-ray. And then as a more ambitious goal, taking a two-dimensional input and generating a three-dimensional output. So what that would look like in concept is taking an X-ray like this that uh, is a little bit of an inlet view and correcting that to a more neutral AP pelvis. And then again, the more ambitious goal, taking a simple AP pelvis X-ray and generating a 3D output like you might get with a CT scan. So for our last section here, very brief, our efforts in OSAIL on education. We believe that educating the world on this topic is very important. We wanna be a leader in that. And we've taken a multifaceted approach to help make this possible. We've published a series, or excuse me, we'll be publishing within the next month or two, a series of four how-to manuscripts, so to speak, within the Journal of Arthroplasty that'll show interested parties how they can do research of this type. We've also developed a series of AI education videos to complement this that can be found on YouTube. And we've been contributing to symposia at orthopedic and radiology meetings and to forums like this. Lastly, we've developed a lecture series and coursework in the Mayo Clinic Graduate School to help educate the next generation of trainees that are interested in this type of investigation. So some of the final take home points today. I hope I've shown you that OSAIL is a strong interdisciplinary group and we're committed to leveraging artificial intelligence to help us maximize registry-based research. Furthermore, image annotation, risk modeling, and image generation are all AI techniques that are influencing clinical practice and research in the here and now. And while AI is certainly not magic, it will enable us to solve some unique problems over the coming decades. And I hope you've seen some good examples of that here this morning. Lastly, we'd love if you'd connect with us. This QR code will link to our external facing website that shows the project we're working on, the personnel within OSAIL, and all of our contact information. If you'd ever like to reach out and discuss project ideas or potential collaborations, we'd be delighted to hear it. 
So with that, I'd love to thank you for your time and attention. I'll now turn it over to Dr. Ruzroke, and then after his talk, we'd love to take any questions that you might have. All right, so just let me a second before I can pull my screen. All right. So can you see my screen on full screen? Yes, perfect. All right, perfect. Thank you very much, Hilal and Cody, for your kind words and Cody for the brilliant introduction to what we have done so far in OSAIL. And hello to everyone. So uh, what I'm going to talk about today is basically uh, very, very much relevant to what Cody just described. I'm going to dive deep into one of our cornerstone projects. And then uh, for some final slides, I'm going to explain how that cornerstone project actually made us enable to go through some other projects and then how all these together uh, you know, are placed in a big picture that can finally help us to have better data. So with that uh, quick introduction, let me jump through my presentation here. So you all probably have heard that data is the new oil, and that's uh, you know very commonly said in the world of data science, and that is true. Uh, yet you know data and oil have a lot in common. Uh, two of the most important ones are actually challenges that we need to tackle with both of them. First, they need refinement, right? And in the world of data, that basically means that we need to curate and annotate our data, and then. We must have enough of both oil and data in order to enable ourselves to do something valuable after having the data. And that's, as you know, is actually the uh, main challenge and concern whenever somebody decides to work on some project using deep learning methods. And basically, we need to think about the data and how much data we have for that. And unfortunately, this is a question that the answer for which is task dependent. So we could not easily say how much data is needed for training deep learning models of all kinds. Now, let me jump through our problem statement here. So as uh, Dr. Weiss mentioned, OSAIL has access to several well-curated clinical registries, including the total joint registry. Uh, yet there is a problem uh, you know, with the kind of work that we wanted to do that only having access to a clinical registry is not going to be adequate for putting together projects and you know, at least doing them in an efficient manner. Uh, so let me look at what we did about two years ago, retrospectively, and tell you that, you know, uh, when we started working on our initial projects, we actually had one or two publications out. And you know, we, we had some models that were working, including that angle calculator on uh, pelvis X-rays that Dr. Weiss talked about. Yet we realized that there is something wrong with the workflow that we had. And that was, uh, we were actually wasting a lot of time on cleaning data and you know, act, I mean, actually understanding if a project is feasible at all or not for our group before we can really spend time on developing a model and you know, uh, working on making, uh, making the model work and add value to our clinical and research workflows. And the problem was that we did not know how many images we had. We did not know how many of those images were eligible for our purposes. And we did not know how much time we should spend on cleaning those images or curating them before we can actually start the real project itself. So with that kind of challenge in mind, we decided to put together a registry of imaging data. So obviously, when you want to put together a, an, you know, a registry of imaging data, you need to deal with DICOM files or you know, the kind of files that the radiology devices usually give to you as outputs. Yet playing with DICOM files is not that much easy. First of all, because uh, you need to go through them one by one doing a manual labeling, which is obviously very tedious. And on the other hand, even if you want to do that based on the DICOM metadata, which is something that you basically can read on PAC systems whenever you open up and scan, uh, or you know, an, an exam for a patient, that metadata could be prone to errors. It's not 100% accurate. And that basically could lead to a lot of problems for us. And uh, unfortunately could not answer the needs we have for curating our data uh, you know, to a near perfect extent. So what we did was that we actually tried to put together a pipeline based on AI itself to automatically con construct the registry of heap and pelvis radiographs. And as Dr. Wiles mentioned, we are not doing this for other joint areas as well. So to put it in a nutshell, our goal was to use AI itself for putting together a clean data set or registry of all imaging data we had, in this case, heap and pelvis radiographs, in order to enable ourselves for doing more AI stuff. So that was how we actually jumped into 
um, you know, serious AI business uh, when we started working on different projects. Now I'm going to, first of all, uh, talk about this project by itself, you know, how we put together that registry. And then I'm going to talk about some, uh, you know, how we actually address some of the common issues that we had with that registry. And this is going to be the place where I'm going to leverage a lot, uh, you know, uh, what Cody already talked about and how those projects that he mentioned and introduced is going to play the roles here in order to make us have a better registry. Now let's start talking about uh, uh, building a minimal registry as the first point. So the first, uh, I'm going to talk about the methods. And you know, for the methods, uh, as Dr. Weiss mentioned, we went through about 20,000 patients with total arthroplasty between 2000 and 2020, and pulled about 800,000 hip or pelvis radiography DICOM files from those patients. So we had a lot of imaging data that the IT retrieved for us and we transferred them to our servers. Now, then we put together a pipeline for cleaning those DICOM files in a manner that could basically help us uh, with building that registry. So the first thing we did, and I'm going to explain these three steps in more details very shortly. So the first thing we did was to actually screen the DICOM metadata, which I already told you is unfortunately not that much accurate yet. We still did that as our first step. Then we put together a deep learning model that could basically classify the appearance and the radi radiologic view of the images. And finally, we relied on already developed angle calculator for hip and pelvis radiographs in order to measure the inclination and version angles of those radiographs and added them back to our registry. Now, talking about the metadata, the DICOM metadata screening phase. So what we did was that we first went through all the DICOM files we had. Some of them, unfortunately, have missing, inaccessible, or cropped imaging data. So we needed to exclude them, and we did. But at the same time, we also tried to put together all the metadata that we could retrieve from those DICOM files and also save the imaging data of those DICOM files as some sort of easy to use, um, you know, portable network graphics or as is uh, more common to say PNG format files. So here is, here is a list of all those uh, metadata uh, actually tags that we retrieved from the DICOM files. So you see that these include uh, the routine tags like the patient name, ID, sex, the requesting physician to more imaging relevant type of tags like you know uh, the serious instance UID, a study instance UID, or SOP instance UID. So uh, many of these tags might not look that much familiar to you, but basically those are the tags that the PAC system usually rely on in order to pull up a, a, an image for you and show it to you accurately. So we wanted to have all that data in our registry. Now the next step we did was that we now relied on uh, you know, a deep learning model in order to classify the radiologic appearance of our imaging data. So here is an example image that we had. First of all, we fed it through an AI model, in this case, an efficient net B3 classifier, which is a fancy name for an AI model that can look at images and classify them into groups. And then we train that AI model to let us know if the image has an AP lateral or oblique view, what is the laterality of that image, and if it is preoperative, which means it doesn't have any kind of implant in it, or if it is postoperative, which basically means if it has any kind of at least one implant in that. Now, you, you can see on the bottom hand of the screen that we had a lot of images that were classified as non-standard. So these were basically images like, you know, knee radiograph, like CT data or MR data that were somehow retrieved uh, in our initial pool. And we had it there. So about the, of those 800 something thousand data that we had, not all of them were, uh, you know, hip or pelvis radiographs. And as we uh, guessed initially, we need to clean them a lot in order to be able to work with them. Uh, so in the next step, we obviously excluded those non-standard data and then saved the appearance and joint coordinates if available uh, for the lateral and oblique images. And then finally, for the AP hip and pelvis x-rays, we curated them one more step. So we trained a second AI model this time an object detector model and an object detector deep learning model is actually a model that can look at an input image and put something like a bounding box, a rectangle on part of the image that you're interested in. So in this case, we were interested in knowing what type of joint is present in that image. Don't forget that we are talking about AP hip and pelvis x-rays. So basically we were looking at left or right preoperative or left and right postoperative joints here. So the YOLO model we trained, the AI model we trained, was able to pick those four different types of joints. And then it also gave us the exact coordinates of those bonding boxes that it put on the joint. So this will help us further on to crop our imaging data for some of the projects. At least our AP imaging could be very, very easily cropped if we needed to. 
and basically we can focus only on one single joint if needed. And then we obviously uh, push them back to the registry that we had for the lateral and the oblique images as well. And now uh, we move to the um, second step of our methodology here. So basically I told you earlier that we had our angle calculator for the hip and pelvis joints ready on that time. It was published, but we had an already validated workflow uh, established in our lab. So what we did was that we basically ran that already validated model on our entire registry. So imagine all the AP and all the lateral x-rays that we had in that registry, we have spent about two or three nights at most, and we let the model go through those. Um, and you know, after all the processing and after all the calculations, we had those images uh, and we basically had those uh, measurements that we were interested in. And then finally, uh, we, we actually fed all our data through a common separated value type of file, which is basically an Excel file that you could open. And then, Tested, tested the entire pipeline on about 5,000 diacoms that were screened and classified manually. So we imagined ourselves as the deep learning models as, as this entire pipeline and went through 5,000 diacoms and tried to manually organize them, manually curate them, and finally applied the model on the simple set and tried to compare the two performances with each other. Now I'm going to talk about the results as well. So basically, uh, for our, uh, first of all, for the classifier model, which basically was the model that could, uh, you know, classify the radiologic appearance of the imaging data, uh, we, we, we needed to exclude about 200,000 diacoms. Most of these didn't have any kind of imaging data in them, but some of them were actually non-standard data. And then we, we could put together the entire registry annotations in less than eight hours, as Dr. Weiss mentioned. And here you can see the details of how many images we found from different views. And then uh, obviously the, the performance of the model was pretty much uh, near perfect. So our, our registry has some errors obviously, but those errors are not that much frequent that we, uh, we feel bothered for doing different projects that we had in mind. And then uh, here you can see some images of the categories, different categories that uh, our classifier and YOLO deep learning models actually uh, annotated for us. So on the left-hand side, you see the different uh, categorizations of imaging data. And on the right-hand side, you see those bounding boxes that I talked about. So as you see, almost all images on the right-hand side are AP, HIP, or pelvis x-rays. And you see that the YOLO model has put some bounding boxes around the joints of interest. And it has determined if there is an implant in that joint or not. And then we have also saved the coordinates of those bounding boxes as well. And here is the results uh, for applying the angle calculator model on the entire registry. Again, the performance, Dr. Wiles already talked about that. It was uh, pretty much near perfect. So we, we felt quite confident on uh, you know, applying that model into the entire registry and then saving the results back to the, back to the registry itself. So basically now in our registry, we have two columns that has uh, you know, the inclination and version angles for whatever eligible imaging data that we have in our registry. And here is, uh, you know, a, a kind of a very uh, simplified version of the Excel file that we usually work with. So as you see, all the above PHI are quite synthetic, so there is no real patient data in this screen. But we we have something real like this. So there is a very very heavy Excel file that we had. Um, I mean, that was actually the output of our pipeline that has all the patient data. So basically, we can very easily sync this with our clinical registry. So if you imagine our clinical registry, every row is for a specific patient and we can pick that patient, come to this imaging registry and find whatever rows that have that patient data on them. So basically this means that these are the imaging data for that patient. And for all those imaging, we have uh, whatever relevant tags that we were looking for from their, you know, DICOM metadata that we extracted initially to their, you know, class, uh, radiologic appearance that our deep learning models extracted. And if AP or lateral, their inclination or version angles res uh, respectively. And here is the paper for this publication that was published about a year ago in JBJS, and you could refer to if you need to understand more details about that. And now I'm going to very quickly review uh, some of the projects that Dr. Wiles mentioned, mostly generative models, and say how those are related to the initial registry that we developed earlier. All right, so I'm going to talk about this in format of some challenges that we had when this registry was actually built in the first place. So. Obviously, the most important challenge is with data annotation. So we had some sort of, uh, you know, classes. We had some sort of features annotated in our initial registry, but we needed more. Uh, as I told you, we basically, uh, as the first step, even during the development of the registry itself, 
we added the pelvis hip and uh, pelvis and hip inclination and version angles to the registry, but there were many, many more things, many, many more imaging biomarkers that we could annotate on our radiographs. So as, a, as an individual to go through that, we put together another paper for the subsidence measurements as Dr. Wise introduced. And uh, we are currently working on making that model even more generalizable. And then we, are, we try to apply the same model uh, to the registry itself in order to measure the entire subsidence, uh, the subsidence value for the entire data we have in our registry. And imagine for a second, what kind of even non-AI research that would enable the scientists to work on, because we will have the subsidence measurements very accurately for about 600, 700,000 of images. And that's how we can uh, you know, leverage this data institutional wise for doing a lot of things, not only AI research, but many you know, non-AI traditional research as well. And we are also working on many other fronts here as well. So even for hip and pelvis, we are working on more, pro more projects, more models. One of them that I can name right now is, is, is currently in the process of development is actually a model that can look at cough and stem and uh, give us the name for the hardware that was used in the surgery of the post-operative image. So basically, um, you know, the number of imaging uh, bio biomarkers that we can annotate and add back to the data uh, uh, is actually infinite. We can work on a lot of things here. Now, the second challenge that we had and uh, even right now have with this registry is that we somehow have some sort of missing cross-sectional data. So obviously every data set you put together, every registry you put together, they have some missing data. And one of your first goals is to understand how you are going to work with that. So we all know that you know the probably the worst way for dealing with missing data is to basically eliminate those data points uh, and you know uh, pre, uh, predisposing your data set to a lot of biases that could be prevented in the first place. Uh, but some of you might decide to impute your missing data. And that's what we already we also decided to do, but not with you know, regular statistical methods. Instead, we used AI to put together some sort of conditional imaging data for those patients we did not have any imaging data for, or at least they were missing some sort of um, um, you know, interesting imaging data. So here is the exact same uh, you know, graphic user interface that Dr. Wives showed to you. And you know, if I play this, you would see that the user uh, interface lists, uh, you know, lists the data scientist or the surgeon to put together some sort of variables like the view of the x-rays, the visible joint, you know, whether or not uh, the, the user wants some processes in that. And then finally, they basically can put together and generate the imaging data that we, are, we were looking for. So that's something quite interesting. And the possibilities here are endless. We even can conditional, um, uh, you know, these deep learning models on some sort of already available imaging data. So it basically can generate uh, missing imaging data for some patients that are quite matching uh, you know, their prior available imaging to us. So there are, there are different possibilities that we are currently working on. And our end term goal is to actually look back at our registry and try to impute whatever cross-sectional imaging data that are missing there so that we can complete it. And now moving to another type of missing data, which is longitudinal data. And again, this is related to the THA net algorithm that Dr. Vaz already introduced. So as you look at this image, what you can do here is that, oh, sorry. What you can do here is that, uh, is that basically you could base uh, you could put together an implant. Uh, uh, sorry, it seems that the video is not playing. So what you uh, what you could do here is that you basically could put together uh, post-operative imaging data for some patients whose uh, post-operative real post-operative data is actually missing in your registry. So if there are some patients here for whom you have the pre-operative imaging data and you do not have the post-operative, you could basically rely on this algorithm to generate the post-ops and the Reverse uh, is also quite easily possible. So some patients have the post-op and you might want to generate the preoperative imaging for that. And that is also something that we can do using the similar workflow. So for some patients, uh, we can actually step up to complete their missing longitudinal data as well. And now uh, there is a more interesting problem here, uh, which is actually a little bit more known to everyone. And that is the problem of imbalanced data sets and bias. And what it means is that for some sort of patients, uh, you know, we, we do not have enough data of a specific features or a specific you know, uh, demographic features that they have. So for example, imagine that uh, most of the patients as could be easily guessed uh, in our registry are white patients, yet we do want our models to be able uh, to work adequately good on patients who are from other races or other ethnicities. And that's something that we could at least work on using AI. So what we have done so far, and this is the courtesy of my great colleague, Dr. Khosravi, uh, we can basically generate imaging data that have different races or different ethnicities. So as you see here, we have three different x-rays, uh, all preoperative and all from the same view for three different races on the screen. 
And even more interesting that, than what you are currently seeing is that we can even using AI have a single image from, for example, from a real white patient and only change part of that image, part of the imaging features that is relevant to race. So basically we can convert the image as if it had come from a patient uh, you know, with a different race like African American or Asian. So that's how we can tackle the problem of bias in our data sets. So imagine that after a while we can have a data set that is full of data points, but are, uh, those data points are actually equally distributed between different, uh, between different races. And I'm honored to also mention that this algorithm was recently granted the Center of Digital Health AI and ML Enablement Award from the May Committee. And finally, uh, you know, even if we could address all the previous uh, issues with our registry, we sometimes have low quality data in our registry that we do want to correct in some ways. But unfortunately, as we are dealing with radiographic data, not three-dimensional data, that would be very challenging. So as Dr. Weiss mentioned, sometimes we do, we do want to change the rotation of a radiograph in some, uh, you know, in one of the three main planes in a three-dimensional space. So for example, we want to change the anterior posterior tilt or left to right tilt of a radiograph, or maybe we want to just rotate it a little bit as if we were playing with the three-dimensional data like CT scan. And that is something that we are currently working on. And uh, as kind of our preliminary results on the right-hand side, you can see the exact same radiograph, pelvis radiograph that had been rotated uh, or better to say, had been tilted anteriorly and posteriorly to actually generate images that are, uh, you know, inlet or outlet view of the same pelvis uh, for the user for the user surgeon. And that's something that we intend to do, not only for the tilt, uh, anterior posterior tilt, but also for rotation in the two other dimensions as well. And finally, as Dr. Weiss mentioned, our, our final dream is that we can also have a three-dimensional uh, CT scan data or bone reconstruction data for all these radiographs. And that would mean that we could have about 700,000 CT scans for our entire registry. Uh, with that, I would like to go through some final thoughts and then I would like to finish my presentation. So as kind of deep uh, limitations, uh, you know, depending on purpose, data cleaning can definitely go much beyond putting together an initial registry. So almost all other AI projects that we start working on, they need their own cleaning as well. But our job has become much, much easier compared to the time that we started our workflow without an initial registry in establishment. And then like any other machine learning based models, our registries, whatever AI models that we use in order to complete that registry could be prone to errors. Uh, we should definitely acknowledge those errors and try to mitigate them if possible. If not, we should at least know that the errors are there and we should warn whoever is going to work with that data that the results might be a little bit deviated from perfect. Now, as future directions, uh, we definitely want to build similar registries for other areas of orthopedic surgery. We want to leverage the current registries for developing more AI models and basically apply those models back to further expand those registries. And we also want to mitigate the registry, uh, uh, migrate our registry to a, uh, to a CQL kind of data set, because that is something that uh, could be regarded as the gold standard or you know, as a standard workflow for putting together data sets and registry. And that is something that uh, one of our colleagues here, Dr. Mulford, has recently started to work on and we will soon uh, have examples of that. So in summary, we developed a highly accurate series of deep learning algorithms to rapidly curate and annotate uh, patient radiographs for totally orthography patients. And then our early pipeline can be used by other institutions or registries to construct radiography databases for patient care, longitudinal surveillance, and larger scale research. And then finally, AI models can help expand clinical and imaging registries in numerous ways. However, each AI model has its own limitations and these limitations should be carefully taught and if possible mitigated in further use cases of the registry. I would like to thank all the amazing colleagues and mentors uh, with whom we have been collaborating during the past two and three years and whose names you can see on the screen. And with that, I would like to end my presentation. Thank you. Thank you, Cody Puria. We have just a few minutes for questions, and, I, uh, and there is one question from Dr. Nelson in the chat box. It's about uh, the biases. You know, the is there enough uh, primary image data for different racial and ethnic groups for training these uh, algorithms to create the synthetic images and you know, would we be introducing more bias when we use limited training data for different racial and ethnic groups? Yep. So basically, uh, so Cody, if you don't mind, I can give my initial thoughts here and then feel free to correct me wherever I was wrong. So uh, 
first of all, uh, this this challenge is actually true. If you do not have any imaging data from a single uh, from a specific type of race or ethnicity, then working on generating those is definitely impossible. However, this is not the case for most of the patients we have. Our problem is usually that we have few, uh, a limited number of patients for different races and ethnicities, and our goal is to leverage that limited data we have in order to expand our data set. Another thing to mention is that there is a lot of possibility if you can leverage uh, you know, similar data from other institutes, from public registries, or even from other areas, not specifically the joint area that you are interested in, but for example, say from the shoulder x-rays, from you know, the chest x-rays, if there are other kinds of radiography data available for patients uh, who are from that specific race of interest, we still have ways in order to leverage the style, the bony, the muscle style of those images in order to generate some sort of realistic pelvis images for those patients. These are definitely synthetic. The kind of diversity that, better to say, the standard deviation of the data with respect to imaging features is not as good as the real data, yet it is much, much, much better than using you know, regular imputation techniques or simply uh, removing those data points because we did not have the imaging data. I have a quick question. That was fantastic. You guys are doing some incredible work. Um, all the data you've generated so far, I think, is with your own registry. Is that right? Um, have you tried to use images from, say, another registry from another group and apply, you know, the same machine learning analysis um, that you've been doing? Will it transfer immediately or are you going to have to make any changes when you work with a, a different uh, registry? So all the algorithms that you saw presented here today so far have been developed internal, internal data, uh, but you bring up an extremely important point and question uh, that it needs to be externally validated. It needs to be iteratively improved from collaborating with outside facilities. And we do have preliminary efforts uh, underway doing that. I, we, we didn't present any of that this morning, but we have some external collaborators. One of the big challenges uh, is with data sharing, as you well know, and getting past those logistics uh, has been quite difficult. So we have sort of version one uh, developed, and we are working with a few key partners to do some pilot projects for some of the more mature algorithms to externally validate, but more importantly, not just validate, but iteratively improved, because as practice patterns are different across the country, we're going to see um, Different, uh, different combinations of things, but also the x-ray views uh, gotten uh, routinely obtained in some practices are different than here at Mayo Clinic. So that's also important. Right, right. And is there a big influence on the, I guess for the plain radiographs, the actual instrument that was used to take the images is not gonna make a big difference like it might with MRI? Uh, believe it or not, it can. Um, okay. So that's one of the factors we control for. And, um, uh, with some of the algorithms, Poria probably has the numbers off the top of his head closer than I do, but on some of our algorithms, we're training from greater than 130, 150 different devices, because um, that is an important variable. Um, and it's an even more important variable when you get out of certain institutional walls where nuances of protocols and nuances of machine and even contracts with companies on what machines are using yeah. can have subtle but important influences, because these algorithms are extremely powerful, extremely smart. Like the example I show where it shows um, it's able to generate a patient ID marker. You know, mm -hmm. it can use as shortcuts for better or for worse to arrive at answers inappropriately. Right, right. Thanks. Yeah, great work. So we're at the top of the hour. Uh, I just wanted to say thank you again to our speakers for an excellent presentation. Uh, and just wanted to note this was part of our collaborative CCCR series. Uh, and this uh, recording will be hosted on the UNC CCCR uh, website. So if you do want to come back and take a look at this or share this, uh, it should be available uh, within a few days. So thank you all. Have a, have a good rest of your day. Thank you. Thank you. Goodbye.